Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 15th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Just going to quickly run through, a, if I could move to the next slide, even. Uh, why is this not rolling? There we go. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps. Uh, for anybody who hasn't uh, joined us before, I'm just going to quickly run through an overview of the setup, um, a few little housekeeping things, and then we're going to get straight into our first presenter. So we generally run these on a fortnightly basis over, over an hour. Each company has a 30 minute slot, which we kind of break down roughly into a 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes of Q&A at the end. If you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box rather than the chat function. The, the, the Q&A box uh, is is much more effective for getting getting the questions done in an orderly manner. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably on about Monday of next week. So if you want to watch uh, this back or watch any of the previous uh, 14 installments of this series, um, please uh, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, you can also follow Coffee Microcaps on Twitter. It's probably where we're most active. Uh, LinkedIn from addition, some additional long form content. I also run a weekly paid newsletter, which can be accessed through Coffee Microcaps at substack.com. Uh, our first presenter this morning is going to be Swift Media. I'm delighted to be, we're joined by three of the team actually from Swift. Uh, we've got Pippa Leary, the CEO. We've got Kirsty Davison, the Chief Customer and Strategy Officer. And the new CFO, Jeff Greenberg, is also going to be joining us. That'll be followed by Rue Life Group. And we're going to be joined by the CEO, Mr. Brian Carr. So without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to the SWIFT team now. All right. So Kirsty, you can start sharing your screen and I'll let you know. I can see the cover slide now, Kirsty. So Pippa, you're ready to go. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Well, good morning, everyone. And thanks for taking the time to be here at this uh, nine o'clock on a Thursday morning. Um, we presented to micro, Coffee Microcaps this time last year, actually, and in the ensuing 12 months, there's been a lot of change to the SWIFT business. We've made great progress in strengthening, streamlining, and expanding our market opportunities to position ourselves for long-term growth. So I'll go through some slides uh, just to update everyone, and then I'll be pleased to take any questions out the back. So if we move on to the first of our slides. For those of you who are unfamiliar with SWIFT, we're a specialist technology company and we provide entertainment and communication solutions to connect and engage isolated communities. We supply into what we call closed loop environments. The easiest way to think of us is like the entertainment system on a plane, except one where the airline or indeed the pilot gets to communicate one-to-one -one with every passenger using the TV screen. Like other tech companies, we have high barriers to entry. 70% of our revenue is subscription-based. And this is typically derived from three to five year contracts where the facility owner pays the fee to view. We have two big growth opportunities. Number one, we're a leveraged play on the mining and resources capex boom that's underway at the moment. And then we're also leveraged to the reforms post the Royal Commission and the COVID recovery that we're seeing in aged care. In aged care, we're also linked to the structural tailwinds of an aging population. So we basically compete in three verticals. They're mining and resources, aged care and health and wellness. And what we've done is we've customized our unique technology to meet the different needs of customers in each of these verticals. So for example, we allow mining companies to both entertain and communicate with their FIFO workers, either by showing them early release Hollywood blockbusters, sport or free to wear television. But we also build a communication system. It's very much like a hotel compendium and it's capable of sending these FIFO residents and mine workers individualized messages. These messages might be 
as simple as a cyclone warning. And in the Pilbara, they, they happen all the time. Um, it may be a change to the flight schedules to Caratha or to Perth, but it's importantly, it, increasingly, it's about OHS. So they're getting messages out about mind safety and increasingly mental health, which is becoming a huge issue due to the social isolation on these very remote mines. Now, in some cases, we work with the traditional owners and we create indigenous content specific to each mine location so that the FIFO workers can watch this like a trailer before consuming other content on the system, which as you can imagine has in the last couple of months become very important. Now in aged care, we have built a fit for purpose product that solves for social isolation by connecting 80 to 95 year old residents with their families and loved ones using technology they know and understand. It's the TV set. They really struggle with mobile phones and they struggle with um, tablets because they're so old. So we literally tune 10 new channels onto their TV sets. So it's a simple channel up, channel down experience. And this allows the facility to engage and communicate with what are often immobile residents. So the core idea behind SWIFT Plus is to very cost effectively improve the 15 hours of awake time for the residents in these aged care facilities. And then in health, in the health vertical, um, SWIFT acquired a digital out of home advertising business that owns 30% of the screens in GP waiting rooms all over Australia. Uh, this deal was done before I joined. And when I joined that business was burning cash. We've now worked to remediate the business and it's now profitable. So if we go on into mining and resources, I just wanted to show you a, a, a case study to demonstrate what we provide and some of the barriers to entry when supplying services in these remote locations. This is, this is an image of Corona Downs. It's a relatively small um, village which belongs to Atlas Iron. It's 240 kilometres from Port Hedland and we've just recently completed um, fitting this one out. So we provide the wireless internet um, for the work emails, the ability for the FIFO workers to call home and for recreational use. Um, but just to illustrate, you see it's on, on that mountain. Um, cabling through a mountain like this can be incredibly difficult you know, one of our strengths is that we know how to do this and we know how to cable into these really remote areas. So using the internet we've cabled out to the village, we then provide on-demand movie and entertainment and TV services, as well as the ongoing communication services to the 136 rooms you see in this camp. We provide them for the next three to five years. Once we're embedded, there is very low churn. Last quarter, we renewed 100% of our contracts. So our system is cost efficient, it's reliable and it's scalable. What you see on the screen is a very small mine. We easily scale up to over 5,000 rooms. And the way we do that is we create a local area network in the mine. We then drip feed all of the heavy data like movies in the off peak periods so that the whole mine can simultaneously stream and have a high bandwidth service. But this is done incredibly cost effectively. We then provide 24 by seven support to these remote mines. What's interesting is that very few of our competitors can supply all three parts of this process, the design and construct part and the cabling, the comms platform, and then the support. So the superiority of our offer was validated because we won this it's a very competitive tender process. You've got to be able to win all three parts. We go um, into a little bit more detail in mining and resources. I'll just talk through some of our growth opportunities. In mining and resources, we see we operate in a market of about 140,000 remote rooms, um, and we currently have 21% market share. We work with tier one, tier two, and tier three miners. So on our roster, you'll have Rio Tinto, Atlas Iron, FMG, Oz Minerals, Mineral Resources, Chevron, Impex, we pretty much go across the gamut. So we're very well placed to capitalize on the $40 billion mining capex boom, especially in iron ore and gold. We already have a leadership position in iron ore. These tend to be the larger permanent mines, but interestingly with the gold price so high, we're beginning to see real demand to refurbish the old gold mines, which we can get done very, very quickly. 
Importantly, uh, you know, when we look over the horizon, we're looking at copper and lithium, which we feel are going to fuel the carbon neutral energy boom. All those minerals that I've been speaking about, they're all mined remotely. That plays to our strength. We're also further refining our platform to in enhance its ability to really meet those compliance requirements about OHS and minor mental health. As I said earlier, we can supply that indigenous content, um, and that is beginning to be in, in very high demand. But we're also developing um, our abilities to further individualize the safety certifications um, and other OHS, which make us a must have in terms of mine compliance. We're also expanding into adjacent markets like exploration, mobile, rail, and road camps. This is important because these mobile camps, they precede the permanent camp. And this allows us to move much earlier in the mine life cycle and establish a relationship with the facility manager, the builder and the miner before you know, the first um, piece of earth is turned on that new mine. As a result of recent improvements in our delivery and support functions, we're also seeing a significant increase in tender activity. In quarter one of FY21, we saw a 28% increase from the prior corresponding period. Now the next vertical we're in is in aged care. Aged care is an umbrella term. It encompasses residential aged care, um, what a lot of people know as nursing homes, um, in-home care, and then retirement villages. We've chosen to focus initially on residential aged care. There are over 220,000 rooms. The reason we like it so much is that less than 15% of those rooms are currently serviced by anything other than free-to-air television. We also like the sector clearly because it has structural growth. COVID and the Royal Commission have highlighted the social isolation issue. Our new fit for purpose product, Swift Plus, solves for this. Despite the access restrictions that we are seeing from COVID and despite the fact that they're continuing to be a challenge in, in the last quarter, we were still able to sell and onboard Swift Plus into 800 new rooms across five aged care facilities. They included Applewood, Riverview, Adventist Care, Ross Moyne Waters, IRT and Andrew Kerr. Off the back of COVID, we've also created an app which allows the facilities to communicate easily with the families of the residents who've been cut off through lockdown. Um, also, as we've seen restrictions begin to lift in some of the other states like WA and South Australia, we've begun much more aggressive outbound marketing and this has resulted in a flurry of new sales act opportunities in Q1. And we are already seeing um, sales opportunities accelerating as the Eastern states begin to move out of lockdown. If we flip on to the next page, um, I just wanted to highlight the importance of SWIFT Plus is that it demonstrates that we develop our own proprietary technology. We're not a reseller of anyone else's tech. Last year, we introduced a new agile product development process to SWIFT, and we used insights we've gained from primary research into the needs of residents to build this new SWIFT Plus system from start to finish in under six months. And what we're finding is that this technology is expanding our addressable markets. The value of this tech is that it's flexible. Um, it's perfectly suited to communicating and engaging with residents who are isolated, be that due to health restrictions we've seen in aged care or the geographic isolation we see in those remote exploration camps. But now we're beginning to see isolation due to quarantine restrictions. So recently, we just won the contract to supply SWIFT Plus into um, Howard Springs, which is the government's new quarantine facility in the Northern Territory. With 29,000 stranded Aussies looking to return home, we expect these facilities to start expanding very, very quickly. And then finally, as I said, we've been very, very busy in FY20, streamlining, strengthening the SWIFT business, and now we're beginning to see this, the positive early results of that work. In Q1 FY21, we saw 160% growth in EBITDA year on year. Um, we're beginning to see very good margin expansion, as you can see from that graph. Um, we saw, again, 5% in that, in that first quarter. Revenue was up 5.9, and that was up 23.4% on, on Q4 of FY20. Where we saw our strong growth was definitely in the mining and resources revenue. That increased 50% over Q4 and 30% over the prior corresponding period. We also saw a 200% increase in project revenue. It's important, it's a lead indicator for recurring revenue. The business's cash flow continues to improve. 
we were effectively operating cash flow break even for the quarter, um, which was a great improvement on the previous quarter and which was 1.5 uh, million to the negative. We've also seen very prudent uh, management of our cash resources by Jeff Greenberg, who's our new CFO and his team. And this saw us ending the quarter with 1.9 in net cash reserves. And then finally, um, you know, we operate in those three verticals, but we have very strong growth ambition. This slide that you're seeing now, it's an important new disclosure and we've released it to the ASX this morning. We wanted to show that after an important period of restructuring, we now have the confidence to look forward and provide an aspirational growth target. In 2025, our target is to triple the revenues of the group, of the group organically. Clearly acquisitions would be on top of this. So how are we gonna achieve that growth? Um, we have two growth strategies. The first is obviously increase share in our existing markets and then extend into adjacent markets. In 2025, we expect to have three times the market share that we have in aged care today. Um, and we also expect to have 27% of the rooms in mining and resources. We will also have started to build good footholds in the adjacencies of retirement villages, in-home care and aged care in New Zealand. This will add additional sources of long-term growth. So in conclusion, we expect our revenues of 23 million in FY20 to be around 70 million in 2025. We have strong growth ambitions at Swift. We aim to be a much larger company than we are today. And we're building for that future. Today, our sales pipeline, our sales pipeline is far stronger than it was six months ago. And this is setting us up for strong growth in 2021. So why don't I pause here and um, I'll open up to questions to either myself or Jeff, who is on the line. Uh, thanks, Pippa. And uh, yeah, uh, remiss of me not to mention that uh, you're a returning presenting company, although we're oh, now uh, we're now <laughs> in, a, in, in a virtual format than in uh, my more preferred in-person format. Um, but hopefully sometime next year, we'll maybe get back to having uh, in-person ones. Um, okay. We've got a couple of questions coming online and I had a couple emailed ahead of me for somebody who couldn't join us this morning. But let me let's tackle the online ones first. Um, who holds the other market share in the mining camps? Is this the companies doing it themselves or is there a competitor that you guys normally come up against? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And it goes back to what I said about, we have very few competitors who do all three parts of the process. So we have some competitors who work against, you know, who, who compete against us in the first part, which is the sort of more ICT part, which is the design and construct and the cabling. And out there, you might find a DXC or an Aquira, um, uh, tech services, a, a number of, you know, smaller businesses like that. Then in terms of the delivery of the platform, which is where we get all of our recurring revenue from, the entertainment, um, really our only competitor in this area would probably be Foxtel. Um, but what's interesting about Foxtel is they don't do the first part and they definitely don't do the last part, which is the support. So if a mine decides to go directly with Foxtel, they then have to go and contract a, a company like us or similar to us to then do the on-site support because Foxtel simply don't do that. Um, and then in terms of support, yes, you know, there are other um, uh, competitors like Aquira, um, DXC do again, do a little bit of that. So we are quite unique in the fact that we do all of these three parts and that's why we, we hold such a strong position in that market. Yeah, great. And then another good question, I think the occupancy risk either in the aged care business or the mining camps business, are, are they a, a take or pay style contracts? Uh, interestingly, um, what we do is we've, we've managed to actually do very favourable deals with our, you know, our Hollywood studios and the BBC, um, but then also um, we've done, we're able to do very favourable deals with the mines. So with some of the mines, we will do um, monthly audits and we'll look at what those occupancy rates are. But in our contracts, we do always build in um, a buffer. So they do contract for a certain amount of rooms over that time. If that really drops, um, then they can come back and try and renegotiate with us. What we tend to do is if we do see a drop, 
then we will say, okay, you'll need to extend the contract from three years to five years to cover us for that. And they're usually very happy to do that. Great. And then um, another question on the, the medical media business, um, I guess, is a core to, to SWIFT moving forward. And uh, the question is, it seems to have little, little in common with the rest of the business other than uh, I guess I guess yeah. the it, it's on a screen and, and you guys uh, do a lot of work in screens. Yeah, it's on a screen and it is and it is recurring revenue, but you're completely right that that is where the similarity ends. The strategy behind acquiring medical media, which was done previous to, to, to my time, was very much based on the belief that Swift might be able to take the core media sales skill set and apply it to their screens in hospitality, aged care, student accommodation, um, mining and resources. But the, the issue with that for me was I came from a digital media background, 25 years of you know, innovating and selling digital media. I was very aware that to compete in programmatic or any kind of um, online display uh, media sales, you need to have massive scale. Um, you, you know, when I say massive, if you're not able to serve a couple of billion ads a month, then you're probably not going to keep your head above water. With 60,000 screens, and a lot of those being in, in uh, remote locations and in aged care where the end users are in basically the last 18 months of their life and they don't have credit cards, it wasn't really a viable option, for I felt, for selling advertising. So what we've done with the medical media business is we've, def we've remediated it. It was burning a lot of cash every month. And the reason was because the sales model was ineffective and very expensive. So we've moved to a very different sales model. Um, and that's actually proved to be very successful. Um, and we've also put a lot of focus on um, client retention. You know, I mean, it sounds 101. Um, but because we've done such a good job, we've uh, doubled our retention rate and we've still got you know more improvements that we can make we've basically taken a whole lot of costs out of the business but we've retained tons of the recurring revenue so today it's an EBITDA positive um, and you know it's it's a great little business but the, your core observation is right the core swift business is really about recurring revenues in these closed loop environments and they don't really come from selling media they come, it's much more of a, a specialist tech company, whereas the medical media business is much more of a, a media company. So as we speak, we are, um, we're, you know, exploring options for how we would realise more shareholder value with that business. Um, the good news is that, you know, it's not like we're in a huge crushing rush to do it because we've now made the business profitable. And every month that goes by, it gets a little bit more profitable. So we've, we're happy with that. And then at, um, a question I had um, from that was emailed ahead and, and one we have now, the, the opportunities to expand internationally, um, New Zealand, mm -hmm. I think you mentioned in, in that strategy slide just at the end, yeah. um, um, uh, the, the, the other person was asking, um, that was emailed ahead of time about you on, I think on the mining side, moving internationally with some of the I guess the bigger tier one, maybe tier two miners who have operations in other remote locations, um, yeah. the, the feasibility of that, I guess. Yeah, that is a, that's another great question. So interestingly, we've, we've explored that quite a lot. Um, and what we've found, we obviously look to markets that most resemble our own. They've got to be remote. Um, so we, you know, we looked to Canada, uh, we looked to, into South America, and we had a look at Asia as well. What we did find is, even though it is the same mining companies, um, in Australia, Australian miners are treated, um, you know, like no other miners in the world. Because the mines are forced to compete for FIFO workers, they have to create really excellent conditions for them. You know, they compete on the food, on the beverage services, on the movies that we supply all this sort of stuff. When we looked at, say, South America, what we found was that Rio Tinto may have a mine. They will um, 
put in for just senior management, their own staff, then all the rest of the staff will be Indigenous and local populations and they don't provide for them <laughs> with the same level of care that the Australian mines have to um, in order to attract uh, miners in there. So that's less feasible. What is feasible is um, if you think about the closed loop nature of what we do, we do currently have some um, contracts with the Department of Defence. So they interestingly have a, a lot of bases and a lot of areas where there are Australian soldiers where they also need to be able to talk to them in, in a closed loop way that is, is secure for them, but still allows them to have somewhat contacts uh, uh, with home. Um, so yeah, so we, we think that actually the Department of Defence um, has some good um, some good potential, and we, we're always in uh, conversations with them. Um, but we, you know, while we always will talk to Rio and we will talk to BHP and we stay in contact, um, the thought that there are multiple mines um, on the scale of the Pilbara or, or Northern Queensland is probably not as viable. Um, and then on the aged care business, uh... They wonder how were you able to win eight hundred aged care rooms during the shutdown, um, <laughs> and what what are the implications in terms of, I guess, installing, upgrading from those rooms that you've won, or from other providers? Given you know COVID looks like it's got well, it yeah. is already a, a extended longer than anybody thought in terms of yeah. actually getting on site uh, at these facilities. Yeah, absolutely. The ongoing restrictions on the eastern uh, on the eastern seaboard have definitely, um, you know, been a challenge for us. Um, so when we saw that uh, the next Melbourne lockdown was coming and that it would be a while before we could get into the um, aged care facilities on the eastern seaboard, we literally pivoted all of our attention and our focus to WA and South Australia. Um, their restrictions were much lighter and, and they came off um, far quicker than over here. So most of those, pretty much four out of five of the facilities that we talk about are located in Western Australia and South Australia. So that's how we were able to do that. That being said, we've just installed in a couple of IRT facilities um, in Wanoona and, and Wollongong, and we're beginning to see... Um, the first feedback and it's it's excellent. So um, we've been able to work individually rather than go and do 5,000 or 2,000 uh, rooms at once. We're now picking off and working through facility by facility by facility. And that seems to be um, more amenable for some of the multi-facility providers as a way of doing that. Um, it's, you know, a little bit more challenging for us but in terms of aged care, you've just simply got to, <laughs> you've got to play the cards you've been dealt for this one. Yeah. And then one final question, we can just squeeze in since we have two minutes left. Um, I know you mentioned one of your content providers is, is the BBC, as is Foxtel. How are those agreements structured? Do you, is it a percentage of revenue? Uh, is there like a minimum payment to access the content? Uh, it's it's uh, we try to stay away from minimum payments to access the content and we try and uh, link all of our payments to the room numbers. Um, they do vary a little um, between our different um, providers, but generally what we push for is a um, yeah, is a is a per room. They take a cut of our per room fee. OK, great. So we're going to leave it there. Um, I'd like to thank yourself and the, and the rest of the SWIFT team for joining us this morning uh, and joining us for the second time, uh, a great supporter of the, of, of the Coffee Microcaps uh, event series. And with that, I'm going to hand over to our second presenter uh, this morning, uh, Brian Carr from Rue Life Limited. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mark. So, Brian, if you want to start sharing your screen, uh, I can see your cover slide now. You just need to go into um, slideshow mode there. Right, uh, right screen. Uh, 
Yeah. Uh, there you go. We're just on the cover slide now, Brian. Right. So can you yep. see the right screen there? Yeah, I can see the next slide coming up on the... How's that one? Actually, I've got it. I think this should be right. You're on the screen. Can you see the cover slide now? Yeah, perfect. Great. Thank you, and uh, thank you, Mark, and thanks for the opportunity to present um, and very interesting paper. Um, just to give you some introduction on Rue Life Group. So we are a digital marketing and e-commerce company operating in the largest e-commerce market in the world, China. So our, our focus is really about taking international brands into China. Now, just to little bit of background about myself, um, 20 years experience operating in the um, public company arena in the CEO, CEO and managing director role, but um, 10 years specifically on the ground in China, working in the e-commerce and mobile payment space. Uh, and that's very much the focus of uh, Rue Life. Now, as an e-commerce provider, we market uh, international brands. Our, our initial business model was initially to take Australian brands into the China market. One thing I've found in my experience is that every company that I meet wants to enter into the China market, wants to sell it into the Chinese market, but just doesn't know how. So to, I, for us to act as their trusted partner, whereby our operations, um, we have offices around Australia, um, and also a very talented team on the ground in China, whereby we operate as a Chinese business. So we provide a very uh, safe conduit to market. And one thing that we have found uh, has accelerated, obviously with the COVID lockdown globally, that has created a whole new sector of e-commerce and online shoppers. We know ourselves that um, when, you, when you've been locked down, um, there's plenty of time to get online and actually obviously the necessity as well to get online and shop. And that's something that we've also seen manifest itself in, in China. It's created even an, an older generation of people who previously weren't uh, sort of shopping online have now worked out that it's pretty easy and it's a pretty good way to, to quickly shop, spend and uh, get products delivered. Now, what we're doing is we're matching demand. One thing that we see in China is that Chinese consumers are looking outward. They are, they, Australia is very fortunate to so regard it as, as a sort of uh, high quality, um, high value, safe, reliable um, uh, manufacturing and, and product base. And we're, we're actually seeing that that demand extends out, um, is still growing very, very strongly. And those brands are really um, looking to how they enter into this market. And we, they, we see as, as coming along with Rue Life as the safe and reliable way to achieve that. Just, a, just to put in context us as a company, um, we're two years along in, in, in our journey um, in the e-commerce sector into China. Um, market cap is uh, around about 17 million as of yesterday. Um, the company is well capitalized for growth. Uh, cash reported at the last quarter, end of September was 1.4. Um, and in October, we finished a, a well-supported rights issue, um, raising an additional 5.4 million there. So key message from that is that um, the company is well equipped and capitalized to continue the strong growth that we've achieved um, over the last 18 months um, to two years. Now, some of these, uh, the, the reason for this slide is really just to put in context and sort of explain that many people won't have heard or seen some of these um, brand names and platforms, but the e-commerce market in China is very sophisticated and mature, um, more so than when we operate in the, in the West. The uh, e-commerce is operates on a from a, a, a social e-commerce perspective so it's very much trust and recommendations so um, these various um, logos that you see on the screen some are very very large operations um, such as Tmall, uh, Taobao so the Alibaba um, stable now they have the reason that they are so successful is that people know and trust in that shopping environment. 
Now there's a range of other additional next tier level downs um, platforms such as VIP.com, um, such as, as JD, whereby these groups have very specialist or, or they tend to actually aggregate a particular demographic. So our role is to match the demographic of a buying platform with the demographic of a, the buyers for a particular product or brand. So our, our expertise is to build up brand awareness, trust, credibility, um, and to bring together all of those online methods to get the best sales outcome for our clients. Um, and so just to also give you a bit more background there in terms of how that relationship typically works. RuLife becomes the brand representative in China. So the brands engage us on a, on a uh, monthly revenue basis for us. So it's a strong, stable, uh, recurring revenue base that we know um, is coming in each month. And as we continue to add additional clients, obviously that grows, it's accretive. But importantly, we also share in the commission for all the products that we sell. So our interests are aligned with, the, with our client customers, um, but we also get rewarded for, for the jobs that we do it. Now, often when you see China, when we speak of China, we see very large numbers and putting in the context of the Australian market, um, it is the reason that we focus on China. Um, building out and accessing a customer base of uh, 500 to 600 million online users that we can uh, reach, transact with, re-engage with, is really the strength of, of our business model. The mobile payments process, once again, just a bit more background, um, Chinese um, buying methods and payment methods uh, are 99.5% uh, mobile payments. China is now a cashless society and it's happened very, very quickly. So the way that we engage, transact um, is via people's mobile wallets, and that's either via Alipay or WeChat Pay. Um, we would say that probably about 60% of our transaction value passes through the Alipay payment method. So it's an extremely um, important method for us and our customer base as well. Now, the types of products that we focus on and deliver into China are really in um, the personal uh, consumer space. So we have quite a rock wide range of, of products and also jurisdictions that we sell out of there. So just to give you an idea of some of these brands you, you may not be aware of, but just to, for example, Colab's Dry Shampoo is a UK brand that we represent, it comes from a group called SLG Brands. Now SLG Brands has about 30 different consumer uh, brands in their portfolio. So for us in securing that relationship, we see that as the first step to an ongoing and obviously uh, hopefully expansive relationship. The spread there, if you look across the, the top line, um, Colab's UK based brand, Asano New Zealand, Vita US, Inica's Australian brand, uh, New, New Rhea is a, a US brand. And we're seeing very, very good, strong growth from those, those goods um, in the China market. Um, the next uh, layer down is we, obviously everyone's aware of the very strong success that Chemist Warehouse uh, has in its relationship into the Chinese market. Just within the context, uh, Chemist Warehouse is the most successful foreign selling online store in China. This traces back to the perception and regard that Australia is held in for being a safe, high quality provider. In the last couple of weeks, we, RuLife has partnered with AFT Pharmaceuticals. So ASX and New Zealand Exchange listed pharmaceutical specialist company to build out a Kiwi health store. So um, both Australia and New Zealand are fortunate in the high regard that um, both those countries are held in China and certainly New Zealand, as everyone aware is, 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 is seen as a very um, healthy, safe, um, environmentally um, clean and, and safe environment. 
And we're working very closely with AFT to build out the Kiwi Health Store. So we'll be reporting over the next quarter um, how we're progressing with that brand. So um, key messaging there is um, the fast moving consumer goods, um, personal grooming, healthcare and supplements are very much the space that we focus on and where our strong expertise lies uh, in taking brands into China. One of the very important relationships we have is with Alipay. Um, we are a marketing partner with Alipay. Um, that means our role is to um, provide to Alipay merchants marketing expertise. So how do um, companies attract um, particular customers and how do they maximise the re-engagement? Now, there's six companies um, in Australia that have that accreditation. Um, we're very um, happy that we are one of those because our focus is very much on um, digital marketing, engagement and re-engagement and transaction. So the endorsement of Alipay is very important to us. And as I said, it's a, it's a very important avenue of revenue for us as a business. The way that we engage uh, with our customers is um, on their mobile. Mobile shopping is the way um, that most people shop both in China and for Chinese travellers when they're outside of China. So our engagement and delivery is the ability to take any uh, brand, any retail outlet, allow them to connect to Chinese shoppers directly online and to immediately transact using their mobile wallets. Now that whole process can happen very seamlessly. There is no setup required for a particular merchant. We manage all of the back end infrastructure around that and allow that transaction and facilitate that transaction and um, allow and coordinate the delivery of all products and services to the Chinese consumer. So once again, going back to when a brand wants to sell into the Chinese market, we become that brand. We are their, their representative and their outlet to achieve that. As a business, I mentioned we're, we're sort of coming up to two years in our in this current business model. Um, we've seen very strong growth. We've secured a number of substantial brands, delivering um, substantial contract value for the business. And the deal flow and announcement, we've, we've been able to maintain a, a quite a, a strong level of consistency over that. So starting out in April this year, uh, going through to you know, the most recently end of September, we've signed on these brands with these contract values. Now, what that means is that um, immediately we begin earning services revenue and we work towards launching these stores. Once the stores are operating, we also then generate revenue through the sales of the products. So just in the, the bottom of that slide, there's, there's just examples of the two stores that have most recently land, launched, uh, Nurea Skincare and Colab Dry Shampoo. Now, Colab Dry Shampoo, as said, UK brand, I think you'll start to see more of that product in the Australian market. So um, the, I think that that is further endorsement and assist in our selling process into China. Those two stores that are just referenced, um, soft launched in August, and you can see the type of growth that we're, we're achieving. So um, we've been able to drive that, that strong growth very quickly. Um, what's very interesting for us is that November is the premier shopping event in China. So Alibaba single day on the 11th of November each year um, is, um, you know, we will, we'll all see it where Alibaba announces new, new records in terms of the volume of sales and the value of sales. And that's the shopping environment we are driving these new brands into. So we're, we're really excited about what this month will deliver and we're expecting a very strong quarter, uh, which will obviously be reporting to the market on our progress. Um, as a business, just to give you that summation, I, I touched on this earlier on, um, we've on a very strong growth trajectory over the last two years, um, giving just the reference points of FY19, FY 20 and 21, what we've achieved in quarter one, um, obviously moving into quarter two um, of this financial year, 
um, you know, we're very confident that we can continue that, that growth and, tra and trajectory. Putting it in context of what we've achieved as a business, so um, we've been able to grow the revenue over the last uh, couple of years from 700,000 to, to roughly three and a half million dollars last year. Um, with the addition of these new contracts, um, we're confident that we can continue to grow the business very strongly from, uh, from this point. Um, we've entered in this financial year with an existing customer base and revenue base, and we're adding these new contract revenues into FY21, 22 and 23. So um, it gives us a level of confidence um, that we're a strong and growing business and we've got a good strong pipeline as well that we'll continue to, to build on our, on our client base. Now, in terms of what we do and what we're providing into the um, Chinese market, I said it's all things that a business needs in order to successfully enter and sell into the Chinese market. For a brand, uh, we manage all things from logistics, warehousing, importation, the marketing online, um, the, the brand positioning, the brand pricing, um, how we uh, transact with the customer, and ultimately the most important thing for our, our brands is then how we settle payment outside in their preferred currency. So um, we're a complete end-to-end -end solution for any business seeking to enter into the, into the Chinese market. Our business has become global um, even more quickly than we had initially planned. It was always a, uh, a next phase for us to, to address the, um, the global market for, for brands and products um, and manufacturers seeking to enter into the Chinese market. I think that's been accelerated by the COVID experience. So many of these um, brands in their domestic markets will have seen a downturn. Um, they will have seen China's recovery um, coming out of um, COVID. And um, I, I think it's fast track they're thinking about going to China. Um, and that has taken us along for the ride. So um, we're very much now a global player and in taking international brands to China, not just Australian brands. And I think a key aspect and a key um, important way that we're achieving success is by delivering success. So delivering on what we say for our clients. So um, we find that the personal endorsement and recommendation from the existing brands that we operate with is a very um, strong selling tool for us. It also gives us a, a, a very good understanding and a very open um, partnership with our, our client brands um, so that we're able to position and meet their needs as well. The multi-channel approach is, is that we're not just a, a, a one trick pony. Um, it very importantly, in terms of having achieving success in the Chinese market, um, it's about um, having a wide reach, having the ability to match um, a brand's demographics with the platform's demographics. It's about trust, validation, credibility. Um, and those are all the aspects that we manage um, across the board when we take a new brand into China really about what our growth strategy is. You know, where, do, where to from here? Um, we've done very well in securing brands. We've put together what we think is a recipe for identifying, attracting, and uh, contracting with um, significant brands. We are in the right space at the right time. E-commerce has never been as strong. Um, it's growing strongly. It's a, there's a, a growing customer uh, database there. And our business model has, the, has two elements of the fixed in locked uh, down contracted revenue where we know that we're receiving uh, recurring monthly fees. Um, but we also have the, the scalable upside and this is the, uh, the opportunity that China delivers. Um, particular products can become very successful and can grow very quickly. So we have a, the upside um, opportunity for royalties and commissions on all of the, pro, uh, the products that we sell and market into China. One of the things that we're finding is a, is a side product of that brand expertise. So securing distribution, um, understanding a brand, um, securing channels. Um, initially our focus is uh, taking these brands into China, but we're finding that those um, 
those, the, all of the expertise and, and skill sets that we develop around a brand position us very strongly to be taking um, these products into other nearby Asian markets. So we're seeing um, it's open doors for us to start selling online into other territories as well, which is a, another complementary part of our, our business model. Um, just in, in, in summary, really position of, of, of where we sit, we take international brands into China. We look after all aspects of the branding, the marketing and the distribution. And we are a globally distributed uh, service provider. Our products and services come from all around the world. That means that we don't have any particular exposure to a commodity or a product or a jurisdiction. We know that the Chinese consumers are actively seeking to secure purchase and have access to Western brands. We know that Western brands are wanting to sell into China. We are meeting that demand on both sides of that transaction. We built out a very strong client base and we're securing um, new clients on a regular basis and we're well capitalized for growth. So we think we're, we are you know, really well positioned to grow the business from here. And we want to now start communicating to the investor community exactly what we do as a business, what we've been able to achieve over the last two years and the direction we, we continue to go in. So thank you very much for the time to listen today um, and um, open to any questions. Uh, thanks, Brian. Um, a, a bit like Pippa, we had a few emailed in ahead of time for somebody who couldn't join us. I think there's one or two online. I'll just maybe tackle the, the email ones first. Uh, I know you had the slide there with the, the three product verticals. Is the plan to put more products into those verticals? Or are you looking to expand verticals over time as well? Um, I, I think uh, our initial phase is to, to, to continue to find um, more products in the space, which we know are in demand. So that, that really drives, drives our interest is that, as I said, the, um, everyone wants to sell to China. Um, part of our role is to make a critical assessment is about which brands can be successful in China. So we're um, very selective in terms of um, looking at what Chinese consumers are searching for online, what products are growing very quickly, what brands are in demand in, in an informal way. Um, and then we look to, to secure those brands. So that's our, that's our approach. Okay. And then the other question was on the, you know, a close relationship you have with Alipay, does that preclude you from doing uh, or entering into a similar type of partnership with the, the WeChat, I guess, merchants and the, and the, mm. the, the WeChat? Um, no, we operate equally on them and you'll find that just about everyone in China uh, has both. Um, so um, we, we operate very openly um, and um, across both those platforms uh, already, and we expect we will continue to do so. Okay, and then a question uh, on the financials. Um, can you describe the PL item direct expenses of providing services? This appears to grow in line with revenues. Should we consider this line as, as cost of goods sold? Um, it's, and I'm not sure it's particularly what particular reference here is, um, but yeah, I guess the, the cost of service for us is, is um, you know, but our, our sort of our overhead or service cost and a variable component on the products that are sold. Um, so yeah, not quite sure in what context the, the, the question is asked. But, um, well, your uh, email address is up there, so maybe they can maybe contact you directly on that. Sure. Um, and then uh, a question I had just uh, on one of the slides back there from the time you sign uh, a new brand <laughs> on to when first revenues uh, start to come in, is it fair to say that's a, a kind of a three to four month timeline for each brand? 
on average. That's for the, for the product sales. Yeah, that's correct. From when a brand signs on, the service, the there is a service fee component which is comes into effect immediately. Um, yeah, in terms of then establishing a, a new online store, it, re- it typically runs within the three to four month um, period. And, uh, you know, as, you, as anyone would expect, it's about initially launching a new product. It's about positioning and optimising the engagement model and optimising the, the price points and promotions. And that happens um, really from months three to six typically and then obviously our expectation is to continue to grow out those sales strongly into the second and third years okay and then another question i had is so you're acting as their distributor on the ground so you're owning the stock i guess from these brands or is it a case sometimes you're acting on agency basis sometimes you're acting on a distributor basis it might be brand specific yeah, so look, our, our ideal model is that, um, you know, that we, well, I guess probably explaining it, taking a step back and, the, and explaining that, we actually have the rights then to distribute, sell the product into China. We own the online assets. Um, we have all the licenses to import and market it. So um, we essentially become the brand in China. Um, then the um, products that we then a source from these companies. Um, we our ideal model is to source those on consignment, so we hold the product on consignment, um, or we um, have very good visibility of what our our turnover is in terms of products and our timing in relation to um, payments. Is that we always time it so that we uh, receive payment before we're making payment for the product. Okay, and then I'm just checking on time. Okay, we've got time for another question. And what's your cost of acquisition for Chinese customers? And what percentage are becoming repeat customers? Um, that's a very, very open question. I'm operating across many different platforms. Um, obviously, it varies. It varies by the value of the product. Um, the game for us is to continue to resell to that customer. So obviously, the um, the, the cost of acquisition against sale do, is sort of uh, diminishing over time. Um, yeah, so that there's, there's no one answer to that, but it's um, something that we run real time um, every day is um, optimising what that, that cost of engagement is across platform and what the, and even to the extent of which platform is being selected and which social media um, um, you know, platform or approach is being used. One thing I will just touch on briefly that is that the strongest way that we currently sell in China is through key opinion leaders and key opinion consumers. So um, the live streaming, so people presenting um, and, um, and marketing the product is probably the, the most important way to sell into China uh, right now online. And that is an area that we're focused strongly on. Okay. And then the, I guess, probably haven't seen the, the, the fall I have now, but obviously the Ant Financial IPO was was uh, pulled last minute due to yeah. I don't know, regulatory concerns or whatever. I mean, do you see that having kind of any impact in terms of how, I guess, Alipay operates internally within China or is it too early to tell? Uh, I, I mean, not one thing I, I you could be fairly assured of is that the um, Alipay payment method uh, within China is so entrenched; it, it it would be impossible to remove. It is the, you know, the standard de facto people the way that people buy everything in China. Um, so you know, it, it's hard to see how how that changes. I guess the the listing um, um, and regulatory side of things is is probably a different issue. And then if I can just do one final question. Um, I know you've got Australia, New Zealand, the UK and the US. Um, are you open to taking brands from other markets? You know, be they, you know, French brands, Spanish brands, Canadian brands, or is it- Yes, um, what's this space? Um, yeah, we continue to look at our international expansion. Um, it, really for us, the selection process is there's some criteria that we look at um, some are hard and some are soft, but importantly for us, if a, if a brand meets the right credentials, um, has uh, a level of uh, awareness and sales outside of China as a reference point, um, then that's, they meet our criteria. Okay, great. Brian, we're 
just coming up to the top of the hour now, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for joining us this morning on the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. As I said, uh, we have been recording. The recording will be up on the YouTube channel probably on Monday. Uh, if anybody wants to watch it back, um, if they happen to join a little bit late. And I will be in touch about the, the, the next event probably uh, towards the end of the month. Thank you, everyone.